Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here. In this video, I'm going to give you a crash course on bird and flight photography that will have you putting tons of amazing images on your memory cards in no time. I have 10 techniques slash tips I'm going to cover that will give you all the basics you need to start filling that memory card of yours with wall hangers. Also, I have a few related videos that expand on some of the topics in this video that I'm gonna mention as we go. You can find links for those in the description area on YouTube or at the blog post for this video on my site. Let's go ahead and get started. Number one, shutter speed. The number one problem I see with bird and flight photos is motion blur from not having a fast enough shutter speed. For general bird and flight photography where you just want a nice sharp bird, choose a shutter speed between 1 1600th of a second and 1 4000th of a second. My go-to shutter speed for general bird and flight action is actually 1 3200th of a second. So, how do you know what end of the shutter speed range you should be on? For large, slow flying birds or birds at more of a distance, you can use the lower end of the scale. For faster birds, closer birds, smaller birds, which are also usually closer, or birds flying towards the camera, lean towards faster shutter speeds. And when in doubt, if you have the light, just go ahead and use that 1 3200th of a second I recommended a moment ago. Finally, remember that the shutter speeds I'm giving you are only a guideline. I've captured perfectly sharp bird in flight shots at much slower speeds, and sometimes I'll even drop to like 1 20th or 1 15th of a second for panning shots. Just remember, generally speaking, the faster the shutter speed, the higher the keeper rate. And of course, you do have to balance this with the available light, lens aperture, how much ISO you're willing to use, and things like that. Number two, watch your backgrounds. The next tip is to stop shooting against blue and or white skies all the time. They're monotonous. Sure, they're easier on the AF system and not bad if done in moderation. Still, you don't want your portfolio dominated by them. When I see flight activity, I always try to position myself so I have a nice, interesting background that either doesn't include the sky or only includes a small bit of the sky. I think it makes for a much more compelling photo. It's a little trickier to keep your AF area off the background sometimes, but in my opinion, it's worth the effort not to have the same blue sky or white sky shots as everyone else. Of course, there are times blue skies can work. I had an overly ambitious osprey with a huge piece of nesting material, as you can see here, and the clean blue background allowed that nesting material to really stand out. I also don't mind the blue sky in this shot. These fighting black-bellied whistling ducks are interesting enough that the plain background really doesn't matter. Still, the vast majority of the time, I keep blue sky or white sky background shots to an absolute minimum. Number three, f-stops. For most of my bird and flight shots, I'm anywhere from f4 to f8, although on a rare occasion I may head towards f11, but not very often. However, when it comes to picking the right f-stop, there's not a one-size-fits-all answer. When we're thinking about the f-stop we want to use, we're usually thinking about one of three depth of field related concerns. First, sometimes we use depth of field for a little extra wiggle room with focus. For example, let's say you're tracking a bird and the camera misses focus by just a tiny bit. At f4, maybe the eyes are just too soft, but at f8, the depth of field covered you and the eye looks fine. The next depth of field concern is background. With only the sky or clouds as your background, you know, that's a non-issue. But if you shoot with trees and vegetation in the background like I do, wider f-stops make those backgrounds look much creamier. Plus, the soft backgrounds give the bird more of a three-dimensional feel in the photograph. Finally, we also have to consider how much of the bird we actually want sharp. If having every feather tack sharp is a concern, then you'll probably find yourself at f8 and f11 quite frequently. Personally, I don't really care if my wingtips or tail feathers are a touch soft. In fact, they often look better if they are a touch softer than the face. It keeps the viewer's attention where I want it, right on the bird's eye. However, I don't want so much out of focus that the only thing that's sharp is the eye or the face. I try to strike a balance between those. All that said, keep in mind that f-stops aren't the only consideration for depth of field. You also have your distance to the subject, as well as the focal length that you're using, all those considerations. So if you have a more distant subject, you can likely shoot wide open and the entire bird's gonna be sharp. For closer subjects, like this hummingbird, I have to stop down a little, otherwise I'd only have like a sharp eye and nothing else, and it would all be way too blurry. On the other hand, this egret was just fine at f4 since I was using a shorter focal length of 270 millimeter. So when considering f-stop, make sure you consider distance and focal length as well. Overall, 
I find F5.6 to F8 is an excellent place to start for most people. Then just modify it as the conditions dictate. Number four, finding good targets. The hardest way to get flight shots is hoping to randomly chance upon a bird that you can capture in flight as you're just walking along. Unless you knew it was coming, there's a good chance that neither the camera or the photographer is ready for that. The best way to get flight shots is to find birds that are engaged in predictable, repeatable behaviors. Birds that are nesting or building nests are great finds. Plus, you get the exciting behavior shots too. Birds that are coming and going from a food source are great finds. This macaw was one of several flying back and forth grabbing palm fruit. This egret catching a fish right here is another good example. He and his buddies flew back and forth for like a half an hour over this small section of pond. This roller was going back and forth from a high perch down to the grass hunting bugs. Finally, this hummingbird kept coming back to the same flower every 45 minutes or so. Feeding areas are absolutely great. Another great opportunity, roosting areas. You can photograph birds as they come in in the evening and then photograph them again as they head out in the morning. Oh, and don't forget about where the birds are just kind of hanging out. If there are a lot of birds hanging out, there's gonna be some flight shots. Finally, make sure when you find these birds that you can get close enough to get the kind of images you want, but not so close that you disturb them and change their behavior. For general bird and flight shots, I like the bird to fill between a third and two thirds of the frame. Bird and flight shots are one area where I don't mind a minor crop for compositional purposes. And be careful about getting too close, even if it is safe for the bird, you don't wanna get those clipped wings. Number five, exposure mode. First, metering patterns. For Nikon, I almost always use matrix metering. For Sony, it's almost always multi-pattern metering. Those work really well. As for exposure modes, I use both auto exposure and full manual exposure for my bird and flight shots, depending on the circumstances. For auto exposure, I use manual with auto ISO. This allows me to lock in the f-stop and shutter speed I want, and the camera will float the ISO for proper brightness. For more info on this technique, see the video link in the description area. I like using manual with auto ISO when dealing with challenging light levels, like maybe the sun's peeking in and out of cloud cover. It allows me to keep my desired f-stop and shutter speed locked in, while the camera is automatically floating the ISO for me as the light levels change. I'll also stick with manual plus auto ISO if my background is of a fairly consistent tonality, and there's not like a lot of darker and lighter areas that may cause the meter to over or underexpose as the bird flies by them. I use this mode probably 60 to 70% of the time, sometimes in conjunction with exposure compensation. However, if I'm in a situation where I have birds flying by backgrounds that are of mixed tonalities, maybe really dark and really light, I'll switch to full manual mode in a heartbeat. This keeps the camera from overexposing the bird as it flies in front of the dark vegetation or underexposing it as it flies against a light sky. As long as the light levels stay the same, and I set my manual exposure properly, of course, I'll get perfect exposures every time. By the way, when setting that manual exposure, take at least a few test shots to verify your exposure looks correct and that there's no clipping. Then keep an eye on it in case the light levels go up or down. Stuff like that happens a lot around the times we like to shoot around sunrise and sunset. And by the way, if you're a Nikon shooter and wanna learn how to get the most from your exposure and metering system, check out my exposure and metering book. It'll blow you away, tons and tons of tips, tricks, and techniques in there. Number six, wind considerations. Here's the golden rule with wind. Birds take off and land into the wind. If you wanna get shots with them facing the camera as they come and go, keep your back to the wind. If you want side shots as they come and go, keep the wind to either side of you, preferably with it maybe just cornering your back a little bit. The worst situation, in my opinion, is having that wind blowing right in your face. You're gonna get a lot of birds with their backs to you. Most of the time, if the wind is at my back or at my sides or somewhere in between those areas, I'm a pretty happy camper. Number seven, autofocus settings. First, set the camera to AFC slash continuous servo. You can't track otherwise. Next, AF area modes. Now, since this video isn't intended for any specific brand of camera, I'm gonna be fairly general in my recommendations here, although I will give some examples with Nikon and Sony. For AF area modes, I like to use the smallest AF area I can successfully keep on the bird. The smaller the AF area, the more control you have over where the camera is focusing and the system is less likely to grab maybe the background or the wrong part of the subject or maybe the wrong part of the scene. For example, with Nikon, I like Group AF as well as Dynamic 9 on my D5 and my D850. For my Z cameras, I like the wide small area. 
for Sony, I like flexible spot medium as well as tracking flexible spot, both the small and the medium size. Like I say, I do lean more towards those smaller AF areas. However, if you're just starting off or if the action is just too fast, don't hesitate to use a bit larger area if you need it. In fact, the auto area in Nikon and the zone and wide areas on Sony are handy for really fast stuff that you just can't keep those smaller AF areas on. The rule of thumb here is pretty simple. Start with the smallest AF area you think you can manage and if you can't keep it on target, try another larger AF area. When you're focusing, do your best to aim for the head area. If that AF area like gets on a wingtip, you'll end up with sharp wings and soft faces. I often move my AF area from center to left or right, depending on the bird's direction, and sometimes even a bit up or down as well. It depends on the shot. Think about the composition you ultimately want. Ideally, giving the bird space to fly into the frame without cutting off its legs and put your AF point where you think the bird's head should be in the composition. Now, if you keep the AF area on its head, you automatically have that composition you envisioned. Of course, I can't cover every autofocus scenario and setting in this video, but if you're a Nikon shooter and you do want more autofocus info, I have a Nikon autofocus book that goes over everything you ever wanted to know. Number eight, nail takeoff shots. Takeoff shots are one of the most common bird and flight shots, but they cause a lot of problems. First, check the wind direction and look for signs that a takeoff is coming. If the bird is like turning into the wind, and especially if that bird lets out like a little exhaust along the way, maybe he does a little bit of a wing stretch or he leans into the wind a little bit, you know takeoff is imminent. At this point, you may want to crank up the shutter speed just a bit. Normally when you track a bird, you're actually helping keep things sharp since you're moving the camera as you do. You're moving it with the bird. At takeoff though, you're just starting to move the camera and often with a little bit of a quick motion. Faster than normal shutter speeds, like maybe another stop faster than you might normally use for that kind of bird, can help out here. Also, it doesn't hurt to drop to a little bit smaller f-stop here too. The camera can sometimes take a split second to reliably start tracking a bird that goes from like perfectly still to rapidly launching from a branch, so a little extra depth of field can help cover any minor focus errors. The biggest trick though is when you see takeoff is about to happen is to keep your eye in the viewfinder. The second you look away, that bird's going to take off, I guarantee it. Nine, other quick gear tips. To get the best performance from your lens with bird and flight shots, I recommend turning off vibration reduction or image stabilization for faster shutter speeds. You can use them for like slower panning shots and stuff, but you don't need them for normal bird and flight shutter speeds. Next, if your lens has a focus range limiter, use it. Unless you're shooting something like a hummingbird at really close range, you likely won't need the close focus range of your lens. Using the limiter helps you get back on target twice as fast when AF misses and starts to hunt. Also, try to pre-focus at about the anticipated range of the bird for the fastest locks. I often focus on like trees or brush near where I expect to see the bird. Finally, let's talk frame rate. On DSLRs, I recommend using the highest frame rate you have. It'll give you more wing positions and expressions to pick from when it's time to sort your images back home. For mirrorless though, you actually have to be a little bit more careful. Sometimes the highest frame rates come with some compromises. For the Nikon Z cameras, I keep them in standard continuous high mode due to the lag caused by the slideshow effect when using them in the continuous high extended mode. I actually demonstrated this in a Z performance tips video I did recently. With my Sony A92, I'm careful about switching to 20 frames per second since the camera then uses lossy compression for the files and switches to 12 bit. Usually not a big deal, but still a consideration in some cases. In short, Mirrorless shooters should consult their manuals to see if there are any compromises to using the fastest frame rate and then make a decision from there. Number 10, tracking tips. Tracking birds in flight is where the rubber meets the road and there's no substitute for practice. Expertise does not come overnight. One of the best ways to practice is to find some birds you don't really care that much about for photos and just track them but don't shoot. Get a feel for how the birds move and how you need to respond to those movements in turn. This is far easier when you're also not dealing with a blackout between shots. Seagulls make excellent targets for this, as do large, slow-flying birds like egrets, herons, and sandhill cranes. 
Now technique, that's easy. Simply get in a comfortable stance and ideally get the bird in the viewfinder before you need to start shooting. Some people find that just tapping the AF button as the bird approaches works better than continuously tracking the bird. Although once I'm on a bird, I usually keep focusing the entire time. That's worked really well for me. By the way, make sure the camera actually seems to have a nice solid lock before you start shooting. Once the in-between frame blackouts start, it's tougher for the camera to maintain focus if it never had a good lock in the first place and it might go ahead and drop the target on you. By the way, if you have a tough time finding the bird in the viewfinder, check out my video about finding your subject with a long lens linked in the description. It'll show you how to get on the bird the first time, every time. As the bird passes, keep your head, neck, and shoulders locked in and rotate at the hips. As the bird passes, keep shooting until it's far enough that you're just starting to see its tail and it's starting to head away. I prefer the bird coming towards the camera right at the side or somewhere in between those two. I don't like images where the bird seems to be heading away, even if it's just a little. Once you see that starting to happen, that's when you know to let off the shutter release. Too often, I see people shooting tail feathers as they miss another great bird flying in. So be careful of that. When you're first starting out, I do recommend hand holding the camera and the lens. However, as you get better, you may find it's more comfortable to shoot from a tripod, especially for longer duration scenarios or if you have bigger glass. I recommend a good tripod and gimbal head for this. I use the gear shown in this slide. It works great. In my experience, shooting from a balanced gimbal head is almost like hand holding. For more information on using a long lens with a gimbal head and balancing that gimbal, I have a couple of links in the description area here on YouTube. By the way, when you see great action in your viewfinder, don't pause as you shoot. Keep firing as long as the action looks good and the target seems like it's in focus. Finally, I tend to avoid birds that are like directly overhead. There are exceptions to every rule, but belly shots are seldom jaw droppers. I always prefer lower and even eye level type shots. However, if the bird is like too far below you, that's not usually good either. Okay, there you go, a complete crash course in bird in flight photography. Again, these are just general getting started tips. If you're a Nikon shooter and want even more detailed, easy to follow info on autofocus and exposure and metering, make sure you check out my autofocus and my metering and exposure books. Between the two books, there's well over 1,100 pages jam-packed with tips and techniques just like these and for less than a lunch date. Also, remember to sign up for my free email newsletter at my site so you never miss a video, article, or workshop opportunity. And as always, please remember to like, subscribe, and hit that little notify bell. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.